Okay, uh, welcome to the 2018 Rollfest uh, game, game Judge Training Webinar. Uh, you can see here on this uh, first screen, uh, a lot of what we're going to do today uh, can be found at the rollfest.net website. Uh, you can just click on Get in Involved and then click on the game. Uh, you can get a copy of this uh, PowerPoint uh, as part of that, as well as other things like the score sheets, uh, the rule updates, and the most, uh, again, up-to-date rules, and the FAQs. Uh, we'll actually be going talking about uh, pretty much all those documents through the course of this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, so welcome to the uh, judge training webinar. Uh, so there might be a, a little bit of second lag between the uh, uh, and the audio. Uh, just for the agenda today, I'll probably actually spend about half of the time reviewing the game rules. Again, there's lots of rules to be familiar with. Uh, then once we get through that, uh, the rest of these items should go fairly quickly. Again, just talking about what it means to be a judge. Uh, again, stuff to do for you know uh, setting up the uh, competition uh, playing fields and things. Uh, again, the work time and impound procedures, again, what need, judges need to do while working with the teams, uh, then getting ready for the competition, setting up the field, where, how to place and start the robot. Uh, finally, some tips, how you end the round and work with the scorekeeping. Very last thing we'll do is look at uh, four videos and practice uh, uh, scoring with the official score sheets. So first, we'll review the uh, game rules. And uh, Shannon Polonis, our RoboFest coordinator uh, will be handling questions uh, via chat. We'll also uh, pause every now and then to try and uh, take questions. So, so if you do have a question though, uh, please uh, ask it through the chat at least uh, first or get uh, Shannon's attention and then we can pause to take questions if needed. So this year's uh, game is uh, the autonomous tennis ball collector uh, labeled at BC. Uh, you can see in this picture here, again, the playing fields, uh, there's one table uh, that has the tennis balls. And it's basically like the tennis ball court. It also has like some trash objects uh, represented in this case. There's one trash object, a water bottle. Uh, on the other, the ball box table, there's a ball box. Uh, in this case, it's like the upper lid, I think of like a copier, a uh, paper copy box. Uh, there's the uh, box fence, which is like a black uh, foam board, uh, again, cut in a rectangle. And so again, uh, the two main uh, tables there. So those are the official uh, playing fields. Uh, this year's task, uh, students need to develop an autonomous robot that will collect tennis balls on the tennis court table and ideally put them into a ball box, but at least as long as they're moved off of the original table, they'll get uh, some points. Uh, the robot also needs to move trash balls completely off the tables. And all these tasks uh, need to be done completely autonomously. Uh, there's a maximum of two minutes to complete these uh, tasks. But if uh, teams do complete all the tasks uh, in a quicker time, uh, that could be one of the uh, final tie breaks in case of uh, ties. Uh, again, points are earned, at least for the judges. We'll need to look at the final location of the balls and the trash objects. So pretty much all the scoring will be done uh, at the end of the round, what the judges will just need to look for. Uh, at the World Championship, there'll be some additional unknown tasks to these basic tasks. Uh, here's a diagram in the playing field. Uh, again, D1 is basically, uh, again, uh, sort of the starting location area for the robot. Again, the robot will be given some type of uh, location uh, along the north-south direction. In this case here, north kind of points uh, up, south to the bottom. And uh, again, D1 is basically going to be the maximum dimension of a robot, uh, 35 centimeters. The robot can't cross that imaginary dotted line. Uh, D2 will be the distance, uh, closest distance between any two objects, or at least the distance between objects. There's a maximum minimum for that. Uh, most of these uh, things labeled in the picture have maximum and minimum values. Uh, in terms of the judges, one of the main things you'll be responsible for setting up is this distance D3. That will kind of um, show how the two tables are offset in relation to each other. So for instance, if D3 were uh, equal to zero, uh, you basically would have an exact L. Otherwise, it might be something more kind of like a T shape uh, between the two tables. And in general, whatever D3 is set as uh, will determine uh, D4. Uh, there, there's a gap between the two tables, somewhere between three and five millimeters. Uh, that gap, though, is not uh, taped. Again, we just uh, put the two tables uh, next to each other, uh, depending on what D3 is. Uh, then on the ball box table, 
the ball box, its dimensions are length and width, there for L and W. Uh, the ball box is centered inside the box fence. And the box fence is uh, centered at least north to south, again with that same distance D6. And of course, depending on the dimen dimensions of the table, uh, that will affect that dimension D5. So again, we'll, in general, we'll be referring to these uh, items from the playing field. Or any questions yet, Shannon, or should I go on? No questions so far. Okay. Right. Uh, next, we'll talk about the uh, robot specifications. Uh, so again, all robots need to have an ID tag or sticker on the top of the robot. Uh, the robots also need to have a sticker or tag uh, identifying the front of the robot. That just needs to be placed some uh, someplace where the judges can see it. Uh, at the start, the robot's maximum width, width, length, and height are 35 centimeters, any of those dimensions. Uh, then uh, after the round starts, the robot is allowed to expand autonomously uh, to a maximum width, 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 length, and height of 50 centimeters. Uh, during impounding, judges will need to check both the starting and expanding sizes. Uh, robot connector wires are not, uh, oh, or, sorry, robot connector wires are allowed to extend beyond these maximum dimensions. Uh, but the wire should only be used in that case for an electrical connection. If the wire is actually kind of part of the construction of the robot, that's like a loose wire or something, that would need to fit it in within these uh, maximum dimensions. So within the 35 centimeters at the uh, start, or again, autonomously expanded to no more than 50 centimeters. There's no weight limitation for the robots. Uh, the robots can have any type of number of sensors or sensor types. Uh, again, nothing that's harmful to humans is allowed. Uh, we do allow ultrasonic sensors, uh, but they may not be able to detect uh, the tennis balls, but teams can try them uh, if they wish. Uh, the robots may have any t a number of type of motors. Uh, they can use a multiplexer if they want. Uh, it's very important though, any motor on the robot must be controlled by a controller on board the robot. And for instance, like with the junior robots, they are only allowed uh, one controller. So that may affect uh, the number of the practical uh, motors that those robots can have. Uh, other than that, uh, any material uh, or robot kit can be used to construct a robot. Uh, basically, as, lo as long as uh, nothing is harmful to humans. Uh, the one, I guess, uh, exception to that rule is the robots are not allowed to start uh, with any tennis balls or trash objects like water bottles uh, prior to. So that cannot be part of the robot's construction, uh, tennis balls or water bottles. And they can't like preload any of those objects. Uh, the next slide is some differences between uh, junior and senior divisions. Uh, again, both divisions will have a game ending task or task. Uh, for instance, like at the uh, warm up, uh, the juniors had to, uh, for instance, one of the tasks was just to have the robot uh, stop on the uh, box uh, table, uh, in the table, the um, uh, ball box. Uh, the seniors, for instance, had uh, maybe like two tasks. Maybe the, uh, one task might be that same task as the junior. And for instance, like for warm up, the seniors also maybe had to display, for instance, like the time uh, remaining. So typically seniors will have harder tasks than juniors. Uh, the seniors will have a taller uh, box. So again, for the height of the ball box, uh, seven centimeters for junior, 20 centimeters for senior. Uh, the box size, uh, the juniors will use the same boxes for uh, practice and competition, and that will stay the same uh, the entire competition day. Uh, seniors actually might have uh, different boxes for practice in round one and round two. And the seniors actually do not get to find out their round one and round two boxes until after the robots uh, have been impounded. So that's actually going to sort of remain an unknown until they actually compete. Uh, D3 and D4 again basically says how the two tables are aligned in relation to each other. Uh, the juniors find that uh, 30 minutes before uh, they need to impound the robots during the work time. Uh, that's actually going to be an unknown factor. For seniors, uh, the judges will reset the tables uh, after the impounding uh, so that will be an, an additional unknown factor that the seniors teams will not know. Uh, for trash bottles, there's just one for the junior. Uh, for seniors, there's either one, two, or three trash bottles. And uh, juniors are limited to one onboard computer controller. Uh, seniors may use as many controllers as they wish. And that'll be certainly one of the things very important uh, for game judges when you inspect robots. Uh, if it's a junior team, I need to check and make sure there's only one controller if it is a junior robot. Or any questions at this point?
There are no questions. Um, why don't you just keep rolling? And if I do have a question, I will interrupt you at an appropriate time. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, next, just some notes. Uh, again, of course, uh, we try and make sure that uh, everything is as consistent as possible. But again, there's at least a possible error uh, tolerance of plus or minus three millimeters in all the dimensions that we stated uh, in these rules. Uh, certainly one thing that's going to be very important, uh, if there's multiple playing fields, uh, for instance, like multiple uh, junior fields, uh, the chief game judge will check, for instance, to make sure that you know, all the tables are as uh, close as possible to the same uh, color. And again, of course, like the, um, but in general, there'll be unknown factors uh, that may, might be beyond uh, the control. But as much as possible, again, uh, if there are multiple playing fields, the chief judge will check that to make sure uh, playing fields are consistent, at least for, you know, for teams competing in, you know, the same category, the same division. Um, uh, we have, again, the requirement that judges and contestants uh, maintain at least a one meter distance from the field. Uh, that's, so again, uh, basically, uh, the judges and contestants don't interfere with any of the uh, sensors, uh, for instance, like the ultrasonic sensors that robots might be using. And final decisions are based at the discretion of the chief game judge. Uh, next, I'll go over the uh, score sheet. Uh, one of the most important things, again, uh, of course, judges will do is fill out the score sheet on the day of the competition. Uh, make sure, of course, you circle whether it's a junior or senior team. Uh, also, make sure you record the team name, their organization, and the team number. Uh, again, it's primarily to make sure that we have, again, the right score assigned to the appropriate team. Uh, also make sure you circle either first or second round and the field number. Uh, all this top information, again, is also important in case there's any questions, if we need to go back uh, to identify at least, you know, what uh, team and what judges were involved uh, scoring uh, these things if any questions arise. Uh, and the score sheet actually has been updated uh, just this week. So there's uh, hopefully to try and make a few, few things that we saw that were maybe uh, weren't 100% clear uh, from practice. Uh, none of the point values have changed. We just tried, I think, to make some clarifying comments uh, on the score sheet. Wait, so item number one that judges need to check is the location of the tennis balls. Uh, this is only done after uh, when the game is ended. You can, all these items are checked when the game is ended. And again, for uh, judges, uh, you just need to, uh, again, check at least for each ball. Uh, you need to decide if it's on one of these uh, six different criteria. Again, uh, each ball can only earn uh, one type of point value. Uh, maximum points is if the ball is in, placed in the ball box. That's 15 points. If the ball is in the box fence, uh, basically some part of the ball needs to be inside uh, that uh, black foam box fence. In that case, again, if it's not in the ball box, but it's inside the box fence, it would get uh, 10 points instead of 15. Uh, if the ball is on the robot, and this one is maybe one of the trickiest uh, things. Uh, so for instance, it's possible the robot could be inside the box fence, but if the ball is still on the robot, uh, the ball would only get eight points instead of 10 points for being on the robot. Uh, again, to be considered in the box fence or in the ball box, the ball has to be released from the robot to get either 15 or 10 points. And basically, if the ball is still on the robot, uh, as long as the robot is still on the table, it should get the eight points. Uh, also, one thing with the on the robot criteria, if you look for those uh, the three dots, uh, again, the ball cannot be touching the table to be considered on the robot. So if it's on the robot, it actually needs to be off, uh, not touching the table. So for instance, if the uh, robot lifted the ball and placed it in a basket or something, if the basket was on the robot, that might get the eight points. Uh, if the ball has been moved from the tennis ball table, the regional table, to the ball box table, uh, that would be only five points you know, if it's not inside the ball box or the box fence. Uh, if the ball is in the gap between the ball box table and the tennis court table between the two tables, uh, that's only four points. And finally, if the ball has been moved onto the floor, it's three points. And notice if the ball uh, remains, even if the ball has moved from its original location, if the ball has not moved off of the original tennis uh, tennis ball table, uh, then there's uh, no penalty, uh, but no uh, points awarded either. Okay. And of course, just let me know if anyone has any questions about any of those six uh, criteria. Otherwise, I'll move on to trash bottles. But uh, so trash bottles, uh, the second type of thing judges will need to check. Uh, again, please, of course, I guess both for the tennis balls and the trash balls, uh, record the total number. Uh, of course, your count should match up with that total number. Uh, again, uh, teams only get credit if the uh, trash bottles are removed completely from the tables. Uh, that means that the bottle must not touch the top surface of the table at all. 
So for instance, again, if the bottle is moved off the table, it could be touching the side of the table, but at least uh, no part of the bottle can touch the top surface of the, of, I guess, of either table, actually. Uh, if the bottle, for instance, is moved onto the ball box table or placed in the ball fence or it's placed in the ball box, uh, that would actually incur a two incur a two point penalty. So, for instance, the teams and their strategies do to make sure that the uh, robot does accidentally do something with the trash balls that they're supposed to do with the tennis balls. Uh, so, again, unlike uh, some criteria where they can earn points with the tennis balls, uh, they can actually get a penalty if they do a similar thing with the trash bottles. And, but for instance, if the trash bottles uh, do not uh, leave the tennis court table, there's just no penalty. Um, there's also no score award. So that's the top half of the score sheet. And then the uh, bottom half of the score sheet. Uh, item number three that judges need to check for, uh, again, is the game ending mission. Uh, again, that'll be announced at the day of the competition. Uh, again, for that, judges again, you just need to determine whether or not that was completed. Uh, again, circle either zero or one. Uh, again, there's no partial credit. Uh, teams either earn 10 points for if they achieve the game ending mission or they do not earn the, uh, the credit. Uh, item number four, I need to check and see if the robot remained intact throughout the run. Uh, keep in mind, all the scoring is only done uh, at the end of the run. So for instance, if, uh, if a robot maybe fell apart and the team asked for a reset and then they uh, reconstructed their robot, uh, the judges would not uh, would still give credit for that if it remained intact through the run that actually counted for the points. So as long as the robot is intact uh, at, after the final uh, part of the uh, time, uh, the teams can get five points uh, for that. Item number four, uh, resets this year. Uh, there's a maximum of one reset uh, penalty this year, and it's only going to be a complete reset. Uh, teams uh, can either choose to have a reset, uh, for instance, if there's a violation, if the teams either touch their robot or touch the playing field, or actually at any time, if they wish, they can ask for a reset, even if there was no violation. Uh, but there's a maximum of one reset. If the team does ask for a reset, judge, uh, make sure you keep track that that reset was asked for, and then make sure you reset the table as quickly as possible. And again, it's just a three-point penalty if a reset is uh, asked for. Otherwise, if there's a violation or the time ends, uh, you just, again, uh, check the round uh, there. Uh, one thing in terms of the time, uh, it's important uh, when the time is up that the uh, team should try and stop their robot. Uh, judges, you'll need to make sure, again, that the robot uh, doesn't uh, continue to move after the time is up, or again, if the team is a little slow in stopping the robot, uh, judges need to determine the location of all the balls and the bottles uh, when time is up. And it'll probably help again if uh, teams can stop the robot uh, when the round is over, or again, if teams want to stop early, uh, stop the round early, they should stop the robot uh, whenever they're ready to stop the round. Um, and uh, make sure, of course, that you check uh, that everything is correct uh, before trying to reset the field for the next uh, contestants. Uh, then judges, of course, uh, once you record all those uh, scores from items one through five, uh, make sure you add up everything carefully for the total score. And uh, again, uh, you only need to record the time left in seconds if the game ending mission is achieved. Uh, if the game ending mission is not achieved, uh, leave that uh, box blank. Uh, otherwise, uh, if they do achieve the game ending mission, uh, record the time in minutes and seconds. And it's the time left in seconds, which is basically just whatever you see if you have a time that's counting down, I just need to look up and record the time you see on that timer. And then uh, just for reference, uh, it's probably going to be helpful to write down the total ma possible maximum score. Uh, just make sure hopefully that can compare that your total score should not exceed uh, that number. Uh, but the main thing is uh, those calculations uh, will actually calculate a percent score using an Excel spreadsheet. The scorekeeper will do that. Uh, last thing with the uh, score sheet is uh, judges make sure at least one of the judges initials uh, the score sheet and make sure you get an initial from at least one of the team players. Uh, basically, if a team player initials the score sheet, uh, they are indicating that they agree with the uh, scoring. Uh, if the team players do not agree with the scoring, uh, then judges, if there's any uh, dispute, uh, definitely make sure you go and uh, seek the chief judge, and then the chief judge can hopefully again resolve any disputes uh, about the uh, scoring. And then once you get the uh, initials from the team player, uh, then make sure judges uh, have one of the judges turn the score sheet over to the chief judge. And I see the chat has been active, so I imagine we might have some questions about the score sheet. 
I'm going to unmute uh, Srinivas. He says he has a question, and we also had a question earlier that uh, we will cover during the site host setup um, okay. event. But I'm going to unmute Srinivas right now so he can ask his question. Go ahead, Srinivas. We're having a very difficult time hearing you. You can save your questions. Okay, why don't you go ahead and type them up in the chat so then when we do stop and, and uh, ask questions, um, I can ask them so everyone else can hear them too because we're, we're having a challenging time hearing you with your microphone. So, okay, was there another question now? Or, um, or? That, um, I'm going to mute myself again and let's go ahead and continue the presentation. Okay. Yep. And there will definitely be uh, uh, opportunity for any questions at the very end of this uh, presentation. Just want to give you chances uh, earlier if uh, there's a question that's uh, very time sensitive. Uh, next, we'll cover the frequently asked uh, question. And these are going to actually have been updated uh, this week. So there may be uh, some new ones, uh, unless you've uh, looked at the uh, FAQs recently. Uh, so first FAQ, some of these actually, again, are in the official rules, uh, but uh, some of them we just wanted to emphasize. So for instance, uh, the top one actually has been answered earlier, but uh, will connector wires be counted in the dimension when measured? Uh, no, uh, again, as long as the wires are not used you know, for something other than electric, an electrical connection. But for instance, if the wires are actually used as part of the construction of the robot, for instance, the, if the wires are like used to, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, touch tennis balls or the water bottle, uh, then they would have to fit within the maximum dimensions. Uh, the percent score is going to be calculated by taking the total score the teams earned divided by the maximum possible score, uh, which actually could be slightly higher than a 100 uh, this year, at least for the maximum possible score. But then when we get a percent score, uh, everything will be out of um, 100 for the percent score. And fortunately, the Excel spreadsheet will take care of that. Uh, the judges do not need to calculate that percent score. They just need to add up the total score. Uh, the box uh, is going to be have a closed bottom. Again, it does have an open top, but the bottom of the box will be closed. Uh, teams are allowed to move the box outside the fence or off the table. Uh, it just needs to make sure it stays upright. So for instance, uh, teams may not uh, flip the box over to, as a strategy to try and cover the balls. Uh, to get uh, points for the balls being in the box, the box must remain upright. Uh, power will not be supplied at impound. Uh, and also, again, uh, batteries will not be able to be charged uh, during impound. There'll be no chargers. Uh, basically, any part of the robot that's going to enter the competition needs to be inside the uh, impound area, so including rechargeable batteries. Uh, teams will not be allowed to uh, change out uh, batteries uh, later. So teams need to make sure they charge their robots uh, before bringing them to impound. Uh, the robot may not be made to carry tennis balls or trash objects prior to the start. Uh, we had one uh, team that asked us a question about having a separate additional motor that's turned on manually. Uh, that actually, again, uh, would, uh, since any motor, uh, according to the official rules in Section 7F, uh, has, they must be controlled by a controller on board the robot. So any type of motor, again, uh, must be controlled uh, by a controller. And remember, junior teams have a maximum of one controller. They may have multiple motors, just the motors must be controlled by a controller. Uh, we do allow for giving points for continuation. So for instance, if a ball has been hit by a robot and it's kind of rolling, uh, if the action of the ball of the robot hitting the ball happened before the timer sounds, uh, the judges again can wait for the ball to finish rolling to determine what uh, its final location. But for instance, like if the ball is touching the robot when the timer sounds, if the robot was actually pushing the ball, uh, the robot is not allowed to push uh, the ball past when the timer sounds. So the key thing is here, there's whatever action that happened to cause the ball or the uh, ball to move, that action has to be completed uh, before the buzzer, at least the action based on the robot. Uh, but again, in terms of things rolling or toppling over, uh, uh, again, as long as again, the ball and the, uh, or the bottle, again, has left contact with the robot, uh, we can wait to see what happens, at least if things are rolling. Uh, one thing, again, keep in mind, 
In general, uh, students and also judges uh, should not touch either the pl playing field of the robots during the uh, two minute uh, time. So for instance, uh, students are not allowed to remove any water bottles uh, that might fall away from the, from the table or feel like it only gets kind of partially off the table. Uh, so again, uh, once the student presses start on the robot, uh, again, the robot must participate uh, auto autonomously for the entire two minutes unless a uh, reset is asked for. And keep in mind it is a violation if the team members touch any of the playing field materials or the playing field uh, tables or the robot uh, uh, before, of course, you know, asking for a reset. And only the judges should touch the playing field materials uh, at any time during the competition. Uh, then some uh, new FAQs. I think these are now the ones that were updated uh, this week after the uh, warm-up. So uh, a question about what is the official way to stop the game? Uh, so again, the game uh, stops. Uh, uh, one way is, again, if the robot completes the end task. Uh, remember, that task has, has to be the last task completed. Uh, so again, for the time, the robots are not allowed to earn any more points once it completes that ending task. Uh, another possible way that the uh, team could end, so again, if they want to end before the two minutes is up, they should definitely signal the judges, since the judges may not be clear uh, about when the team uh, has done uh, with their task, because uh, this year there is no requirement uh, unless it's part of the special missions to actually have the robot stop. Uh, final three, again, when the two minutes is uh, up, uh, that is the definite ending uh, time. Again, uh, robots again uh, cannot earn any more points after time is up. Uh, if the robot is still moving, uh, again, when the team wants to end, or for instance, when the timer is up, uh, again, the judge should definitely indicate for the team to stop the robot as quickly as possible. Uh, the team should leave the robot in place, though, uh, just in case, so the judges can watch, you know, to see if there are any balls still located on the robot uh, when the team ended the round. And again, the team should wait until the scoring is completed and signed off before turning off the robot or picking up the robot. Uh, it's especially important, I think, about turning off the robots just in case there was an end task that required a display. Uh, the team definitely should not do anything that might uh, again, clear the display before the judges have a chance to determine whether or not the ending task was completed. Uh, another question. Uh, can teams decide where to place the robots north-south for the start of the game? Uh, no. Uh, the robot's uh, location, whether centered or uh, further north or south, uh, will be specified. Uh, this information is going to be included on the unknown factor display and given out, uh, again, to a hard copy on the teams. Uh, for instance, for the warm-up, uh, the teams were instructed to have the robot centered north-south in the starting zone. Uh, but for instance, an alternate um, uh, specification could be uh, maybe the front of the robot should be five centimeters from the north edge of the table. Uh, again, so judges will, will need to check the north-south location of the robot uh, before it starts, as well as the starting orientation, uh, but that will be for a later slide. Uh, teams can put uh, the robot ID label on a vertical surface rather than horizontal. Again, depending on the construction, there may not be uh, uh, an easy uh, horizontal surface near the front of the robot, uh, but uh, uh, basically needs to be uh, visible. And the front of the robot, robot of course, must be labeled uh, on the front of the robot. Uh, again, the last question, uh, what happens if the ball locations change because the team did not stop the robot immediately? Uh, judges need to make sure they watch very carefully to watch where the, um, the tennis balls and the uh, trash object are as time ran out. Uh, more FAQs. Uh, question is, uh, how is it scored if a ball is on top of the fence, not touching the table? Uh, this, I think, actually happened during uh, warm-up. In this case here, uh, we want to clarify that scored is being inside uh, the fence. Uh, so again, I, uh, the original score sheet said the tennis ball had to be completely inside uh, the box fence. In this case here, just part of the ball needs to be inside the box fence is the one minor change we made to the score sheet. Uh, another FAQ, uh, how is the ball scored if it's touching the ball box? table and it's also inside the fence area. Uh, in this case here, like if we look at uh, ball number one uh, there, again ball number one is not you know inside the ball box so it wouldn't get the maximum points but it is inside the box fence. Uh, of course it's also on the box table but it can only get uh, credit for one of those two things and it's given the higher score for being inside the box fence. Uh, notice uh, ball three in that picture is actually still on the robot which is addressed on the following slide as we'll also talk about ball number two. 
Uh, next FAQ, uh, how is it scored if at the end of the round, a ball is being supported by the robot, another ball in the ball box, or a trash object? And again, this is referring to that previous picture. So again, uh, it's again very important for the judges to make sure they uh, keep track of what uh, state the ball was in when the round ended. Uh, this example, ball one and ball two were in the box fence. Uh, but ball three, again, had not been released by the robot, and it's counted as on the robot. Again, in order to get uh, credit for being uh, inside uh, box or inside the box fence or on the box table, the ball must be released from the robot. Otherwise, it counts as only being on the robot. Notice the balls can still be touching the robot, but uh, for instance, if they're not on the robot, uh, they might get uh, different types of points. And I think the last uh, FAQ, uh, how is it scored? if a ball is on the robot, the robot is touching the table, and it's inside the ball fence. So for instance, like the, uh, that's like ball three above. And again, basically any time a ball is on the robot, uh, that basically takes precedence over the other types of uh, criteria. Uh, again, to get any other type of points, the ball must be released from the robot. For instance, to be considered inside the fence area or inside the box. For instance, jumped inside the box with a bunch of tennis balls on top of it. All those balls would be on the robot. They would not be in the box. Uh, the balls have to be released to get credit for anything other than being on the robot. And those are the FAQs. Any questions or I'll keep going. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming in through the chat. Let me start. Sure. Number one, um, the ball box size for junior and senior game, that is addressed in the rules. Um, there's a, um, we, we aren't covering the rules at this time. This is mostly for the judges. The sites will be given the boxes that they are using for their site. The junior teams can answer or can measure. The senior teams, it's an unknown factor. Um, Number two, is there a penalty for moving the box? There is no penalty for moving the box. The box can move as long as it remains upright. It can be anywhere, on the table, on the floor. Uh, it can even lean, but it has to be upright. Uh, any penalty if the robot disturbs the fence? Um, we haven't addressed this because the fence will be taped to the table. Um, so if we have a situation where the fence is disturbed, We'll have to stop the round and retape the table, retape the fence, I imagine. Um, Dr. Cartwright, tell me if. Um, yes, yeah, so or at least b before the next team would compete, we'd want to fix the, yeah. the fence, yes. Yes, there is no penalty if the robot disturbs the fence. Um, the number four, the ball on the black fence is in or out. Um, it will be considered in. Uh, if it's on the fence, it's considered in the fence. It will get scores for in the fence inside the fence. Um, the distance between the balls and the bottle is edge to edge. The question is, is it center to center or edge to edge? That is addressed in the rules. It is an edge to edge measurement. Um, if an unknown task like in the warm up is given to senior team, for example, to display the time remaining, is it at the end? Because if the team chose to leave the robot run for two minutes, then the time left will be zero. Does the team have to choose to let it run and choose the ending task? That's a very detailed question. Um, they will only receive a time if they complete the task. So if if it will be it will be zero if the robot runs through the course and doesn't complete the task but doesn't stop. Um, there is no there is no time score. Um, the only way the team receives a time score a time is if the robot completes the ending task. Um, even if the task is completed, if they choose to leave it on. I'm still a little confused. Um, the, the, this time will end once the robot completes the task. If they complete the ending task, that's the end of the round for, the, for that team. I think we'll have to discuss that offline a little bit. Um, the next question, if the ball is on the robot, but not on the box table, does it score? Yes, the answer is yes. If the ball is on the robot, regardless of where it is, um, 
as long as the robot is also on the table, on either the box table or the tennis court table, it does receive the score for on the robot. Um, number eight, does the team choose to start anywhere in the starting location zone or is it defined location and orientation? The location and orientation will be unveiled to the teams at uh, the beginning of the work time. It is not for the team to choose. They, they must follow, uh, so they're all, uh, they'll be given an orientation north, south, east, or west, and then a location within the start zone, whether it's centered next to the edge of the table or at the north end of the table or the south end or somewhere in between it will be defined and all the teams will follow um, that orientation and location. Uh, number nine, are the cables considered as part of the robot when the robot is placed in the starting position or the wheels in the table or extreme edges of the table? Um, it, the cables are not considered part of the robot unless they're considered part of the robot. Honestly, if a cable is connecting one connector to a sensor, it would be the edge of the robot and the cable would hang over the table. But if the cable is being used as part of mechanism to sweep up balls or move trash objects, it would be considered that part and it would also have to be within this, the maximum um, 35 centimeters up before the robot expands. Um, and then uh, one of the questions I'll go ahead and ask and address right now, the, the earlier question was if the bottle becomes damaged, um, would the team get to get a new bottle? Um, and I think the answer to that would be, we will make sure that the site hosts have extra boxes and bottles and um, fences. Um, they might pull one from the practice table or something, but to, they would make sure that the bottles were, you know, as um, whole as possible, not tilted or damaged if the bottom is, you know, smashed or something because of a robot handling, you know, moving it around. Okay, let me see one more thing. Um, oh, the, the ending task, okay, the question is, can the team decide the ending task? Um, the items can be the the tennis balls and trash objects and um, those things can be done in any order but in order to receive the time credit for the end task they have to do the ending task as unveiled at the beginning of the work time there will be an ending task um, for for the teams at, at the warm-up it was for Think for the junior teams to end up any part of the robot touching the fence or the edge of the table or the gap between the tables or something where wherever um, but it, that, that ending task will be decided will be unveiled to the teams as part of the, the work at the beginning of the work time are there any additional questions Oh, you're welcome. That was it. Okay, let's go ahead and continue on and then we'll stop um, after a few more slides and we, if anyone has a question, I will stop Dr. Cartwright and uh, make sure that we address them as quickly as we can. Those are really good questions for Navas. Thank you. Turning it back over to Dr. Cartwright. Okay. So we're about halfway through the slides uh, now. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so first of all, uh, just for the judges' roles, uh, again, at each competition site. Uh, again, of course, if you have multiple playing fields, uh, there will be two judges that work uh, together as a pair, and then there will be one chief judge, again, overseeing uh, all the judges. Uh, about 20% of teams are expected to advance to uh, uh, world championships. Uh, setting up the sites. Uh, site hosts will receive a playing field initial setup uh, document. And it'll give the dimensions uh, for each division and how to set up the playing fields. Uh, again, if multiple playing fields are used, again, the site host should set up you know, everything as consistently as possible. All the playing fields should be in the same direction. And again, it helps to uh, number each playing field. Uh, so again, the teams will know, uh, you know, if the judge tells them to go to uh, field one, uh, they know which field that is. 
And it's important when the fields are set up, uh, there's enough distance for, uh, again, each team to be able to stand one meter away, not only from their own field, but from other uh, playing fields as well. Uh, practice fields, uh, in general, everything uh, at least that, that can be set up uh, prior to uh, practice uh, should be done. So please set both practice fields and official playing fields uh, before teams arrive. Uh, confidential items, uh, again, like the site host setup documents, uh, need to be kept secure. Uh, impound table that with the team placemats uh, need to be set up, again, prior to team's arrival. Uh, make sure you assign an impound proctor to watch that table at all times. Uh, the pit area uh, with team signs on the tables. Again, make sure that's also set up uh, prior to competition uh, starting time. And again, uh, please assign uh, proctors to watch uh, during the work time and during the rounds. Uh, again, at least uh, during the rounds, uh, the teams actually should not be in the pit area. Uh, during the uh, work area, uh, only team members uh, should be in the uh, pit area and uh, no adults, uh, no coaches. So that's uh, one main thing that the proctors need to watch out for. And again, uh, Rollfest does provide uh, detailed uh, procedures for site hosts. Uh, so again, this is just a sample of the document, I think at least of the uh, first uh, two pages. Uh, again, at least in section A, it's basically the types of things uh, that need to be done one to two weeks uh, prior to the event uh, as a site host responsibility. Uh, then on the second page B, again, are the other things that need to be set up uh, prior to team arrival. Uh, if you have like an afternoon competition, some of that could be done possibly the morning of the competition. Uh, otherwise, if you have an early morning competition, uh, you definitely might want to do that at least a uh, day in advance. And then all site hosts are going to be provided with, um, again, information for setting up the playing fields. Uh, so for instance, here's a sample for uh, junior division for both rounds one and round two. Again, documents like this would be provided uh, for both junior and senior divisions. This is just a sample for junior division. And the next slide, we'll just look at kind of the top of that uh, to look at more detail of that information. Uh, again, remember, uh, junior team divisions, uh, they are given a box, uh, same box for practice in rounds one and two. And so they are allowed to measure those dimensions uh, length and width during the work time. Uh, senior teams need to, of course, be kept aware that the boxes uh, could be different from practice to round one and also different for round two. Uh, for uh, setting up the playing fields for the junior tables uh, and the location of the two tables uh, in uh, reference to each other is uh, set uh, prior to practice. So during the 30 minutes, uh, the teams will have that D3 location specified. Uh, remember for senior teams, that location actually will uh, possibly change between practice and round one and round two. Uh, then for both junior and senior uh, playing fields, uh, after impounding all the robots is when all of the uh, tennis balls and trash objects are uh, placed on the tables. And at least in this case here, uh, later we'll see a, a picture, uh, at least kind of like with the measuring devices. Uh, basically, the official playing fields uh, have uh, like centimeters marked out along the um, uh, east to west direction. So this is kind of uh, measured basically from that uh, bottom left or southwest corner of the table, can kind of uh, how far east you're going along in the east direction, and then uh, how far north. And so at least the east, again, the distance should be actually uh, directly on the table. You can just use that. So you basically just need one tape uh, to figure out how far north to place uh, the objects once you've located how far east. And the ending task, here's the ending task that we talked about earlier. Uh, so, for instance, as a sample, how to end, it could be that any part of the robot is touching the ball box table, but no part is touching the tennis court table. I think this was like the uh, ending task we used for round one. And again, there'll be a, a possibly different uh, ending task for round two. And then uh, the maximum uh, possible score is also indicated on this uh, sheet. Uh, in terms of the setup, again, each playing field needs to have two judges. Uh, you can either have a centralized uh, timer or possibly, again, if you want to have uh, each table run independently, you could have judges with a smartphone app. Uh, chief judges will need to make sure they work with the uh, scorekeeper uh, to make sure all the scores are correct. Uh, there also needs to be an impound area, and that should all, always be blocked and supervised at all times. Uh, coaches need to make sure teams know charging is not allowed in the impound area. So robots need to be charged prior to uh, impounding robots. Uh, once a robot enters the impound area, it is not allowed to leave. And the scorekeeper will be, uh, have an Excel spreadsheet on a, and a laptop to do like the calculations of like the percent uh, score. And the scorekeeper will do the data entry.
uh, uh, new this year is um, only contestants are going to be allowed to access the pit area during basically the entire uh, competition. Uh, that goes for the uh, team tables, the practice fields, and the official game fields uh, throughout the entire competition day, uh, including the setup time before opening ceremony, during work time, and during breaks. Uh, again, basically during the entire competition, uh, only team, team members should be in the pit area or on the official practice playing fields. Uh, coaches could maybe help uh, bring in a material, transferring the material uh, to the tables at the very start uh, of the day. Uh, but once everything is, again, all arrived in the pit area, uh, then again, the adult coaches, mentors, and other volunteers uh, should leave after they've assisted with transporting team materials. And this is a change uh, from prior years, uh, this policy. Are there questions or should I keep going? There was a question regarding the um, time left being taken into account. Uh, historically, it was um, used only when robots got a perfect score. Um, does this rule still apply? Because now at this year, it's hard to get a perfect score. Um, we do anticipate ties uh, regardless. I mean, we do understand that Last year, there were many, many perfect scores because, and therefore, they were all ties. So we used the time left. Um, the time recorded will be only it. Um, the time will be record. Time remaining will be recorded for every round if the robot completes the end task. Um, if the robot does not complete the end task, there will be no time recorded. So therefore. Um, the time will be blank and it could could not be. So if the score is the same as another robot score, the score that completed the end round, the end task would receive a time and therefore it would have a time recorded and be the higher scored. Um, so no, probably without the end task, the team cannot get a higher highest score that this, it could have a higher score, but if it doesn't be the end task, the, the time, I'm at, Dr. Cartwright, can you help me with this? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I, I think basically, I, I think our, our intention, of course, right, the tiebreaker is only really necessary, right, for the trophy winners. So these will be the best teams. Correct. We do not animate teams that are unable to complete the ending task, you know, to be in the trophy winning position. So if, if they can't, you know, complete the end task, they probably can't be in, in the top scores because they'll lose those points. Right. Yes, there might be times. But it's certainly possible the teams, with the, it's possible this year that, that the trophy winners might have less than, you know, like, you know, the maximum top, po possible points, like less than 100%. But in that case there, then the time will be very important than if two teams, you know, like have the same, uh, you know, first and second uh, tie breaks, which is still all based on the score. The, the time is the third tie break. Does that answer your question? Okay, the answer is yes. Or we have a slide later on the tie breaks that hopefully might answer it if it's not quite answered yet. <laughs> okay. Other okay. questions now? Looks like we're getting more, maybe. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Dr. Cartwright, while he types his question, um, and then okay. we'll, we'll circle back and make sure that we answer the question so we're not waiting. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so work time. So again, uh, so far again, we've been talking again about setup. Uh, remember, basically at the start of the work time, teams are given an unknown uh, task and factors uh, data sheet, like this one over here on the right. Uh, again, it'll basically specify uh, again the starting orientation of the robot, either north, south, east, or west. Uh, again, it will also specify again where the robot is going to be. Uh, again, in that uh, starting location, you know how far north or how far south. Uh, for instance, on a warm up, the robot was centered. Uh, again, the teams are going to be reminded that balls and trash objects are going to be set after robots are impounded. So the practice balls and trash objects will probably not be in the same location as the actual round one and round two uh, ball and uh, The ending task will also be, again, given out to these teams on the hard copy data. So this is given, uh, for instance, for juniors, uh, all this information is given. Uh, juniors are given that value of D3. Uh, remember, seniors will not be given this value uh, for D3. But the starting uh, location and the ending tasks, of course, the ending task may be different for junior teams than for senior teams. 
Okay, uh, then once uh, the teams are given this information, they have 30 minutes to work on their robot. Uh, the MC will try and make sure to give announcements when there's only 10 minutes and five minutes left. Uh, so the teams need to know when it's going to be coming uh, close to impounding time. Uh, again, we understand that there might be some type of uh, emergency communication or non-game related communication necessary between coaches or parents or, uh, or and team members. Uh, basically, just if a team member ever has to leave the pit area, uh, it's very important that they be escorted by a judge or proctor. And if there's any communication that goes on between coaches or parents, uh, again, that's not game, that should uh, also be supervised under a judge or proctor. Uh, basically, any coach or parent who enters the pit area, again, unsupervised, or again, any student who leaves the pit area unsupervised would be guilty, again, of a violation of communication with a uh, coach or parent during the 30-minute work time. And again, uh, the judges may assign a penalty uh, for a violation of that nature. Uh, also keep in mind, the 30-minute work time, basically for all the timers at Rollfest, uh, they just keep going. Uh, teams, again, do not get uh, additional time. Uh, for instance, if they need to, like, for instance, go to the bathroom during the 30-minute work time. So team members probably should definitely try and make sure they use the restroom before the 30-minute work, work time or after, uh, not during. And the proctor responsibilities, uh, there's a link to this uh, here. Uh, see, I think you can find this uh, on the uh, website, so I think I'll just let you uh, look at that. But again, if you're a judge, you might also be asked to serve as a uh, proctor. Uh, then again, once the work time is up, uh, or again, teams actually can start impounding robots early if they want to. Uh, judges again will need to uh, start impounding. Uh, each team is going to have a placemat with their team ID on a table. Uh, again, it needs to be a location. Uh, again, it should be set away from the uh, spectator areas. Uh, could be close to the pit, uh, but again, should be kind of separated uh, from the pit area. And this should be a location, again, where the robots uh, can be watched uh, during the end of the work time and uh, during the game rounds. Uh, once a robot enters the uh, impound area, it should not leave. Uh, if you have a small competition, five minutes might be enough for impounding uh, your robots. Otherwise, hopefully, uh, even with a large competition, uh, you can hopefully impound robots within 10 minutes. Or at least in general, te teams need to be in line to impound the robots uh, within 10 minutes at a maximum at a large competition. Uh, the impound table should be blocked and supervised at all times. Uh, it's, uh, to help crowd uh, flow, uh, it's helpful that only one member of the team uh, present their robot to the impound area, and then you need to have at least a couple judges in the impound area to check the dimensions of the robots uh, and check, make sure that all the ID stickers are on the robots at that time. Uh, the other team members should remain at the team table. Uh, this year, again, checking for legal parts. Uh, main thing is uh, junior teams uh, can only have one controller. And again, no robot uh, for either junior or senior team can have tennis balls or trash objects uh, on the robot you know, prior to the start of the competition or just prior to the start of the round. And judges need to make sure when the teams bring their robot to be impounded that they check the team number uh, label and a front label. Uh, check for both those labels. Uh, judges will also check the size of the robot. Uh, before allowing the robot to enter the impound uh, able, uh, area with their placemat. Uh, they need to check the robot. Uh, again, the initial starting size can be no bigger than 35 by 35 by 35 centimeters. And we'll have like uh, sort of like two uh, foam boards they can use to measure kind of like that little box. Uh, those are uh, marked on the boxes. Uh, so the initial size of the robot can't be any bigger than 35 centimeters in any direction. Uh, then the robot is allowed to expand autonomously up to a maximum of 50 centimeters in any direction. And the judges need to make sure they check both the uh, starting uh, configuration, no bigger than 35 centimeters, as well as the expanded configuration. And again, make sure the judges should ask the, the team members again if the robots expand, and they need to see the robot in both the unexpanded and expanded configurations. Uh, if the robot passes inspection, placed on the team uh, placemat on the impound table, uh, again, team members might want to try and, again, check some of these things uh, prior to the official impounding time. Uh, for instance, they don't want to come and find a minute before impounding is up that their robot is too big. If they check the size earlier, uh, that might, if they need to modify the robot, it's probably better done uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, but if not passed, again, as long as the impounding time is good, uh, they could try and come back and fix any issues uh, with the robot. Uh, we certainly encourage teams to impound the robot early if they're done practicing. Uh, there's no need to wait till the last minutes to impound. So again, some of the judges will need to be ready to impound early. And hopefully, again, that can also make the uh, competition run uh, a little more quickly if uh, not all robots are impounding at the last minute. Uh, 
Uh, no charging of robots allowed in the impound area. No chargers will be provided in that area. Uh, it's important that all robots must be impounded uh, by the end of the announced impounding period. You can usually try and give them a little bit of warning before the cutoff uh, for that is announced. But if the robots are not uh, impounded uh, by the end of that uh, time, appropriate time period, uh, they will not be uh, allowed to compete in that round. Uh, if a robot was not ready to compete for round one, it still could possibly compete in round two. And uh, vice versa, even though a robot competed in round one, it still needs to be checked uh, before going into impound for round two. Uh, once a, a robot enters impound, it should not leave, and participants should not touch uh, or remove their robot or any other robots once the robot has impound. Be charged uh, before impounding. And sorry about that. I think I maybe clicked on the wrong. It looks like here we go. Wait, uh, hopefully I'm back, or at least with the, hopefully is everyone still here? It's all good. Okay. Uh, next thing, uh, placing the game objects. Uh, again, uh, keep in mind the uh, tennis balls and the trash objects are only placed after all of the robots have been impounded. Uh, again, this year, hopefully the easiest system to use, again, to mark them. Uh, again, the dimensions in the east-west direction are kind of marked already along, or at least there's a, like a measuring tape as part of the official playing field table. Uh, and then you just need to measure in the north-south direction uh, using like a separate uh, measuring tape. Uh, we'll use like one little, again, we'll provide these uh, to the site host, uh, like one little mark for the balls and two little uh, marks uh, for the ball location. And I think we found during Royal, this, this was, I think, a fairly efficient uh, procedure. It should not take uh, too long to uh, set up uh, the playing fields uh, this year. Okay, uh, then once we've uh, placed the game objects, uh, next thing in starting positions, uh, again, judges make sure you check, you know, that front label sticker, again, for instance, in the picture, uh, again, if the starting orientation is said west, uh, the front label, again, should be on the west uh, end of the robot, and in general, no matter what direction the robot is facing, it should always be the, at least the uh, westernmost part of the robot uh, is uh, lined up with that uh, west edge, but for instance, if the robot was supposed to uh, face uh, north, the front label should be facing north uh, rather than uh, west. And of course, the front could be either north or whatever location. Again, that would have been uh, announced uh, prior to the work time. And then judges again, uh, this uh, 35 centimeter start line is just an imaginary line. Again, as long as the robot made the initial starting uh, dimensions and as long as it's aligned with the west edge of the table, uh, it will be guaranteed to start um, at least uh, behind that line. And again, judges also need to check and make sure the robot starts in the appropriate location, uh, again, along the north-south direction. So for instance, on warm-up, again, we ask the robots to be centered, uh, kind of like was one criteria. So again, judges, when you start, uh, before the students start the robots, make sure you check uh, the front label that's in the appropriate uh, orientation. And of course, make sure you start, check the robot's location north to south. Uh, judging tips, again, uh, please make sure you check the score sheet uh, carefully or uh, check again, make sure you get all the correct uh, information from the teams. Uh, it's important to look for violations uh, carefully, especially take note on whether or not a reset was done. So again, uh, you make sure you uh, either assess or do not ass assess the reset penalty. Uh, remember, if a reset is asked for, you basically just ignore everything that happened prior to the reset. And again, in any case, uh, all scoring is done at the end of the run. Again, once the uh, team has either you know decided you know they've ended their run, they've stopped their robot, or the two-minute timer is uh, counted down. Uh, then make sure you check the location of all the uh, tennis balls and bottles. Uh, if a team does ask for a reset, uh, judges, please make sure you try and reset the playing fields as quickly as possible, since time again could be a factor for the timebreaker. Uh, also, make sure again if they complete the game-ending task, uh, make sure you record the time remaining in minutes uh, seconds. 
And again, hopefully that that'll be exactly as you see it uh, displayed on a timer. And oops, sorry, this was, I think, a typo I forgot to change. The next thing, actually, I'll make sure I uh, change this. If the robot does not complete the ending task, the time remaining should be left blank, as opposed to zero minutes would be if they actually complete the ending task as time expired. So sorry, this is one error that needs to be fixed. Uh, again, a blank time should be different as no time remaining. Uh, again, a blank time would indicate the complete ending task was not completed correctly. And again, if any issues uh, arise that we maybe haven't uh, anticipated, uh, the chief judge again uh, would uh, would have the authority uh, to make again, any decisions uh, that arise during the competitions. Uh, then ending the round, uh, uh, make sure, of course, you uh, record the time remaining if the game ending task was completed. Uh, also make sure you add up all the points uh, for the total score. Uh, it's very important to get initials from the team player. Again, uh, the team player, once they initial it, they're uh, again acknowledging that they agree with the scoring from the judges. And coaches, uh, please ask your team members uh, to double check the judges' calculations to make sure that you know uh, there's no like arithmetic errors or anything. Uh, one judge should also initial the score sheet. Again, that's primarily so if we need to go back later and ask the judges about anything, uh, we can, uh, again, ask the judges who scored that uh, particular team. Uh, then judges, uh, once you've got initials uh, from both a, one judge and a team member, give the score sheet to the chief judge. Uh, the chief judge will check the score sheet and then give that to the scorekeeper. And then for scorekeeping, uh, actually, probably once that's done, actually, then, of course, the judges would just move on to the next team and repeat uh, competition procedure. Uh, the scorekeeper will have an Excel uh, file. And again, this will be provided to the site host uh, prior to the uh, competition uh, start time. Uh, the main thing the scorekeepers need to enter is the, again, uh, just the uh, sort of raw score uh, from the total score for both round one and round two, and also the time remaining that's left. Uh, again, uh, just again, entering that directly from the score sheet. Uh, those scores will then be projected on the screen so the teams can again check to make sure that the data uh, was entered uh, correctly. And we'll try not to display additional columns so that there's uh, no, uh, we want to at least leave some suspense as to who might be the winners uh, for that reason. And it's very important, of course, that the correct max scores are entered. Uh, the chief judge again should uh, check those and make sure that uh, the scorekeeper has those correct scores. So, for instance, this year it's possible the round one maxes might be higher than 100. But again, uh, comparing round one, round two scores, they're going to be percent scores. So at least in comparing scores from teams from round one, round two, being the percent score out of 100. And here, I guess, is actually where it uh, mentions, I think, the uh, tiebreakers. Uh, so again, if two teams have, uh, remember, it's the average score uh, is determines the initial uh, ranking. Uh, if two teams have the same average score, then they go to the best percent score. Uh, of either of the two rounds, and if, if one team had a better score for one of the rounds uh, compared to the other uh, team scores, uh, then if those turn out to be the same best score from both rounds, it would then be the highest time left from the best percent score. And then finally, if that is also the uh, same, uh, then there is the possibility of a rerun as a third tiebreaker. And I guess now I'll pause and see if there's any questions. I haven't seen any additional questions on the chat client. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Um, uh, okay, I think I think we've just covered the tiebreakers. Um, Completing the task, okay, the question is, will there be a possibility that a team without a completing final task, can they tie? Um, does it mean that completing all tasks is a requirement regardless of the score? So the answer is, the, the ending task is, is scored if it's completed. So it, it, it doesn't, it, there have been lots of teams that haven't completed the ending task. So there could be many teams that are, if all the teams com don't complete the ending task, the team with the highest score will win the competition. Um, if this, okay, I'm gonna continue reading the questions. If the score is the deciding factor or completing the task, if that is the case, can the team just start and stop at the end? 
could the, be the least score, but all other robots could not finish the tasks in a tournament. How do we decide? The, the score is the determining factor, regardless of the ending task. The ending task just increases the score, and it, it provides a remaining time if if that can be part of the tiebreaker. So many robots will not complete the task. Um, I'm just I'm. Some teams will have higher scores without completing the task. So the, the time remaining factors into the tiebreaker if teams have a, a tied score or tied percent average scores. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, the ball markings can cause issues for the color sensors. Are all the bar mark markers kind of invisible? The ball markers are the white. Uh, three hole binder reinforcement circles. That's what we're sending to all the site hosts. So they're, they're light in color, they're very small, um, they're all the same. So um, the teams will be able to, they will probably encourage the site hosts to have the ball markers, um, some of them on the table during practice rounds so that the teams can see the color. Um, but it'll be a light ball marker on a lightish table, so it shouldn't. Um, have, you, have you heard any complaints, uh, Dr. Cartwright, or concerns about the ball markers, the colors? Uh, I didn't have any complaints during the warm-up. No, I didn't, I, no team brought that to me as an issue during the warm-up. Trinivas, can you tell me if your teams are having issues with the, the ball markers that we provided in the, set, in the kits that we sent you? Uh, he's not. He's not sure. Okay. So the, all the sites will have the same ball markers. It, it's it's what we we were going to use masking tape, but then it would have been hard for us to you know a little piece of masking tape. Is it one by one? Is it two by two? Is it um, um, you know? So we we came up with those little round um, reinforcement dots, I guess they're called, or circles. And then we'll use one for the balls and two for the trash objects. So when the resets are done, they're obvious which is which. Um, so I think I think the question regarding the score is that you know the the team that wins will have the highest average score over two rounds. And if there's a tie, that's where the time left comes into play. So um, if the team is able to complete the round to ending task or not. If they get all the balls in the ball box, but don't complete the task, but another ball, another robot got, has no balls in the balls, ball box, but does complete the task, the one with the completed task might not be the highest score. So it's just, it's just a way to uh, increase, you know, if, if they're equal in getting the balls in the box, the one that completes the end task will have a higher score. So it's, um, it's not a requirement to, I mean, will not lose points just doesn't gain the point. Then the time remaining comes into play for the tiebreakers. So if a team meets a higher score without, or the, a tied score without having the ending task, and another team has a tied score with having the ending task, the one with the ending task done will beat the tie, if that makes sense, I think. Is that, are, are we all clear now? Okay, he's typing. If the two teams Okay, if the two teams with a high score tie and both did not complete the ending task, we would have a rerun at that point. That would be number three. Because they would have to have no ending score or no ending task for both rounds. Therefore, no time for both rounds. It would be a rerun if, if required. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But if that does happen, it will, 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 will deal. And that's why we, we have the number three. So, OK, I'm going to, you're welcome. I'm going to go back on mute and let uh, Dr. Cartwright continue. Okay, uh, good. Well, we just basically have one more portion of the uh, webinar right now, and that's just to look at some uh, example videos. Uh, so we have four videos, and again, here if you have uh, access, uh, actually I'll probably uh, try and display a score sheet, 
and we can try and see if we can uh, agree with the uh, scoring. So again, these are all videos that were uh, taken at the uh, warm-up competition. And so I'll share the first one with us uh, now. Hopefully I clicked the right thing. Uh, can you see the video, see Shannon? We can. We can see them as you're scrolling Wait. through. Yep. Let's uh, click on one, and uh, it's very laggy, though, unfortunately. Okay, so there's that video. Uh, let's see if we can uh, score this one. Uh, again, I'll, I'll just look at the score sheet, but for instance, for the tennis balls, if I remember right, was one of them moved off the table. They kind of rolled away. So I think that they get three points for one ball being on the floor. And then remember, I think the other, the second ball that left the table, I think actually uh, was still on the robot, but the robot left the table. So I don't think it got credit for that one. Let's see if I go back just a little bit. All right, so the, this is after the reset. Remember, they did do one reset. So this is after the first reset, so they should get one reset penalty of three points. Here it's probably just easy. I'll just I think I can share the score sheet. I should have that up. Can you see the score sheet now? Yes. Wait. So let's see with the score sheet. So in this case here, actually I think. Uh, were the were the balls knocked off before the robot went on the floor? So the question should have gotten any points for any of the tennis balls. I believe there were three balls left on the table that would not get any points. But the two balls, I think they were kind of underneath the robot, I think did not leave the table before the robot did. So it might be that they got zero points for the tennis the trash bottle, I think, never left the table, so they didn't get the 12 points for the trash bottle. Uh, the robot did remain intact. So I think it got five points, and they had one reset. Okay, so at least the scores uh, came up with a score of eight. So actually, I think the robot did, did was given credit, I think, for the two tennis balls. I guess it said two tennis balls were knocked off the table before the robot went off the table. So then I think it earned three points twice is what the judges gave it. There's a three-point penalty for reset and then five points for remaining intact. The game ending mission was not achieved. So there was a total, again, so two times three for the tennis balls would be six. 
three point, uh, five points for intact and three point reset penalty. Total score of eight. Or any questions about that video? There haven't been any questions regarding, uh, there was a question regarding okay. two controllers, uh, but this was not an official, official um, competition, so. Yes, just because it was a uh, warm up, uh, basically, I guess the, the team I think was just using one of the controllers as as a construction, just as a weight. I don't think it was actually plugged in. But, but yeah, uh, we, we made the team uh, aware that they would not be allowed to use two controllers uh, in an official competition. Uh, we'll go to the next uh, video. Thanks, Srinivas. Uh, provide information. They can use the controllers as weight, but only one can be active. Only one can be controlling for junior teams. Senior teams can have multiple controllers. Yes. Okay. Uh, here should be our second video. Okay, so I think uh, for that one, I think the robot did accomplish the game-ending task. Uh, in this case here, I think there were four balls on the robot. Uh, the one trash bottle was removed uh, for 12 points. Uh, I think the game-ending mission was achieved. The robot remained in, intact, and that time there were no resets. So I believe it should have been scored uh, four times eight would be 32, plus 12, plus 10, plus five. Let's see, let me double check. If I added that correctly, I thought I ended up with, let's see, 59. Oh, and I forgot about the one, I think, that rolled off the table, right? It was three points. Uh, the final score should have been 62. Oops. That was a different one. I want to go back to this one. Okay. 
So I think the score for that one should have been 62, the total score. Are there more questions or? There are no other questions. Okay. I guess I'll go on to video number three. Okay, so the team asked for reset. For judges, you just pretend, right, everything that just happened, right, just ignore anything that happened now. It doesn't affect the scoring. Of course, the team doesn't get the time back. The time still keeps going. Okay, and on that one, the team actually did not stop its robot in time, but uh, look in this case here, uh, both the ball and the model were still touching the robot, and they're both on the tennis ball table when time expired. So for this one, uh, I think here there were three balls uh, in the box fence completely that earned 10 points for each of those three balls there. Uh, the other two tennis, ball tennis balls that were still on the tennis ball table would get zero points. Uh, notice actually if the robot had pushed that bottle onto the ball box table, which in fact it kind of did after time expired, that would have been a two point penalty. But because again, the robot had not pushed the bottle off of the tennis ball table before time expired, uh, it did not receive a two point penalty. Uh, the game ending mission was not achieved on this one. On this one, the robot was given five points for staying intact, because uh, again, right, uh, we ignored the fact, right, that the robot came apart before the reset, but at least after the reset, the robot stayed intact, which was the only part of the run that counted. But they did, again, take the one reset uh, penalty. And so I believe if I added up those points correctly, I think that one should have been 32 points. I missed something, let's see. So, so the least, uh, I think the judges scored this one is 37. So somewhere I missed uh, five points. That might be an incorrect assessment there. I, I agree with you, Dr. Okay. It should be 32. Yeah. We'll check with Doug um, Elmer and see if that 37 might have been if they forgot the reset. 
Right. But yeah, so at least I came up with uh, 32. I did also. Okay. We have one more video. Good. Hopefully we'll finish at least the videos by uh, around 8.30 was our promise time. We have one last video. Uh, so this will be our last video will be a senior team. Okay, uh, so for that one, I think there were two missions for the seniors. Uh, one mission was the robot stop touching the box. Uh, the other part of the mission was the robot had to display the time remaining. And I believe this robot did complete uh, both of those uh, missions. Uh, of course, let me back up maybe just a little bit, a few seconds, a few more seconds. Just so we can see where all the final locations of all the balls were. Okay, so for here, right, I think we have two balls in the box fence completely, one ball on the box table, one ball on the floor. And again, no points for the one ball that remained on the tennis ball table. Uh, all three trash bottles were removed. Uh, the game ending mission, I believe, was achieved. The robot did remain intact. And there was no reset penalty. Let's see if we can add that up. I, think I came up with eighty nine. Okay, let's see, this was video four. It says it should only seven. So let's see, what did I miss? Or maybe that was a typo in that score. I think it should have been much more than 27.
Uh, let's see. I wasn't sure if my sharing worked on that last one at the end, but. Are there any more questions? I haven't seen any more. Um, if you do have questions after we uh, end the meeting here, you can send them to this email address and we will respond within 24 hours. Um, hopefully we've answered everyone's questions as well as we can. Um, this really was designed for judge training. Um, the rules, the tiebreakers are very important for the judges to understand what, you know, how that all happens. But when the, when the scores are loaded into the score sheet, the score sheet calculates the rank. So there won't be as much conversation about uh, teams, tiebreakers, things like that. That'll all be hap happening through uh, the score sheet. So hopefully we won't have any questions um, regarding that when we get into the actual competitions. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for attending. This Any board, additional questions? This, uh, this webinar will be uploaded. So if uh, site hosts or judges, uh, if you want to tell your uh, cohorts, your other uh, judges that will be coming to the volunteer, as volunteers for the sites, um, it will be available for judge training. Um, we would really like to have uh, as many judges as possible understand and, and follow these uh, to the letter. Um, it's, it's important for the teams to understand what they're facing. So we have um, clean competitions and we really appreciate everyone's assistance in that regard. Um, Dr. Cartwright, thank you very much for your presentation. Yep. And mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon, for handling, handling the chat. You're welcome.